31. All right. Start All there. right. There's some people that are still joining in. We're up to uh, 31, which is a very good number. Welcome, everyone, to the meeting, not only online through Zoom, but uh, through YouTube. My name is Michael Tucker. I'm currently secretary of the club. Uh, I've been pretty much every other type of officer and, and committee chair over the years from 91 to about 2000. And then, unfortunately, I took a job down in the city for about 10 years that gave me no time at all to do any kind of astronomy or attend any kind of a meetings. And then when I retired from that job, I did the best thing I ever did, which was rejoin the DVAA. And I've been back ever since, and I absolutely love it. And I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, I've been asked to do this this evening because uh, Harold, our club president, and Jan have, although Jan is online here, uh, they have plans for this evening and this weekend. So I've been asked to, to attend to do this meeting. And excuse me, because I haven't done it for a while. So I might screw up a couple of things. Uh, but I want to start by sharing, if I can. We tested this before. Um, go to my notes, my photos here. No, that didn't work. And I got a map up. Okay. There you go. Good. And um, I will try to. I'll try to zoom in a little bit here. Does everybody see that relatively well? Did I lose everybody? Is yeah. That a reading test. Yeah, it's a part of the newsletter right here. Can you make it a little bit bigger, Mike? Yes, I'm trying. Give me one second. Uh, control, right. There we go. How's that going? That's good. All right, good. Um, uh, actually, we're pretty lucky because I have a an advanced copy of the newsletter. There are some changes still to be made, but it will be be ready to go before the uh, first of uh, the new month. Uh, so as far as your upcoming events, you see we had Dark Sky Observing when, toward, the, toward the first quarter, toward the new moon, and we have star parties toward the first quarter. Uh, our star parties, I'm sure we'll talk about it as a club and the officers will be talking about it, but I'm sure we'll be doing them at Valley Forge or another place and we'll be doing them without the actual public next to our eyepieces because of the COVID restrictions. But we will probably plan the same way we did last year uh, as far as um, projecting what we're seeing through the telescopes onto a projector and a screen. Uh, we also will have Jeremy talk about the next monthly meeting and our speaker for that meeting. And he'll certainly announce our wonderful speaker for this month. Uh, so again, you see on March 20th, actually, which is my wife's birthday, the first day of spring, March 20th, uh, we have a public star party, the 26th is the next meeting, toward the end of the month. I'm so used to, when I was back to be president, we usually have them the same time every month, which is usually the first or the second week, or so they're much earlier in the month. This time, they're actually very late in the month, uh, depending again on the, on the new moon and the full moon. So 26th, the monthly meeting, April 17th for the Public Star Party and April 23rd for another, for another meeting. Uh, what I want to do uh, is go through the remaining people as far as the club officers are concerned and then uh, any committee chairs that would like to speak. Um, I know Jan, our current vice president, would like to say a few words. Let me stop sharing. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Jan Rush. And um, thanks um, Mike for leaving this meeting. I think Harold thought I was gonna be gone. Maybe he was wishing I was gonna be gone. I really am here. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, at any rate, um, in, in term, with terms of um, the outreach uh, committee, we do have a couple of events scheduled, but not till June. So I, I'd say that the calendar has a few things on the list 
and everybody stay tuned. We'll have to decide when we get closer what kind of format we're going to be used for those. Mm -hmm. But perhaps we'll be revving up outreach this year, which will be nice. Mm -hmm. And how about welcoming chairperson? Um, I'm uh, Brian Lee, I'm the welcoming chair. Uh, we have four new members this month. Uh, I see two of them are here tonight, Scott uh, Vanneman and Daniel uh, Adibi, uh, along with uh, Alice Zinnis and Riz uh, Rizan, Riz excuse me, uh, Rizan uh, Ironosko. If I, uh, I might not be pronouncing that correctly, but uh, welcome. We'll make sure that we set these people a, uh, a complete setup and i will be glad to talk to them personally if you can get me their name and their number. Sure. Or email address, I'll be glad to talk to them. Welcome to the club. Um, how about our treasurer, Lou Berman, do you have anything to add as far as membership is concerned, dues or this one? No, we're, we're doing really, really well. Hold on, if you just give me a second, I clicked on the thing, I'll tell you where we are in terms of members. That's great. Uh, and uh, so there are 182 people in here, but let's look at only active, you know, and our hope, of course, is that, uh, you know, we're, we're only active 182 people. Yep. There you go. So we're doing great. I I'm really confused, though. It it's members active. I've looked for them. Yep. That's the number. It seems like a really large number. I'm really pleased. That's really it. Pleased. That's really pleased. I'm really pleased also. Um, yeah. Back in the early years of the 90s, it was more like 60 or so active members with probably 110 or so uh, overall as far as the, yeah. but of course our dues were on very, diff very different schedules at, at that time frame uh, on a month to month type of thing, or the people renewed on the month that they originally joined rather than once a year like we do now. So, Yeah. Uh, so the, yes, thank you very much for handling all the treasure duties. I know yeah. it's difficult. I've done it before myself, like I said, back in the early '90s, and uh, I'll have to keep track of. Any anyone wants to fire me, please raise your hand. No, <laughs> please, please. How about any other reports? Um, I know, Lou, you wanted to mention something about the Astro Target Forum. Okay, so we're heading into Galaxy season. So what we're going to do for the spring, I guess, I was having image challenges every month, but I guess the weather is not making that easy for us. So I decided we're going to do it on a seasonal basis. And I'm thinking, uh, since we're heading into galaxy season, we'll, we'll uh, Leo triplet or anything, Macarian's chain, any galaxy would be great. Uh, and, I don't want to um, pick one object because people have different focal lengths and, you know, with a galaxy, you really need a long focal length, but mm -hmm. you know, if you're doing a cluster like the Leo triplet or Markarian's chain or whatever, that opens up, uh, you know, the field for a few more people with longer focal length or shorter focal mm -hmm. lengths. Mm -hmm. So have at it and please post whatever you get on the forum mm -hmm. on the, uh, on the website. I'll be happy mm -hmm. to see it. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you very much. As Lou mentioned, we're actually are coming up on on galaxy season. Virgo, especially in the spring, is absolutely wonderful for galaxies. All right. Anyone else need to add anything before I do my little talk? Okay, I'm going to share a screen then. I'm having a little trouble there, I'm sorry. All righty, try this again. Not quite there yet. Yes, I give you one second. Everybody seeing that? Martian bandwidth? Yes. Got it. All right, great. Wonderful. 
Uh, I hope everybody has been watching the Mars 2020 mission with Perseverance. And honestly, I do forget the name of the little drone helicopter that they will uh, be talking about, we'll be showing later on. But this uh, subject is actually near and dear to my heart. And I know it is to Lou Berman's also, because we're both in the computer business. Actually, Lou is still is, but he's still working. I retired a few years ago from spending 40 years in the computer field. Yeah. But this talk is briefly about um, how, they are, how they were able to send the pictures uh, from the Martian surface, actually from the from the downlink, uh, from the uh, sky, from the sky train, and from the rover, and um, the parachute opening, so forth and so on. So right off the bat, you're seeing that you have a ping time of one point one million four hundred thousand milliseconds, a uh, millisecond, and it's a one thousand milliseconds in one second to give you an idea of I can ping my ISP with about three millisecond ping time and my download and upload megabits per second. And by the way, a lot of places get this wrong, but you should see it as capital M, lower B, BPS. If you see a capital B, that's megabytes. So there's eight bits in a byte. And by the way, half a bit is called a nibble. Uh, but megabits per second, uh, you're seeing two megabits. Uh, that's coming from um, the rover itself up to a, to a satellite uh, orbiting Mars, one of five, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and then beaming down to Earth from there. It's a lot slower when they're going direct to the rover from Earth or from the rover directly to Earth, which they actually can do to send little telemetry messages back and forth. Let me make sure I can go on to this one, next one. Okay, uh, so hopefully you're able to see this on TV. I actually saw it live when they actually did the, not live when it was happening, of course, but when NASA did the presentation, uh, got a sent, I was sent a link through space.com, which I'm a subscriber to, and uh, was able to actually see this uh, NASA, NASA presentation live. Uh, so here you see a number of pictures of 30% 30, 30 speed and real time of the parachute opening up. There was a message in, contained within the parachute, a number of different messages that JPL put in, just like they did the previous mission where they put the little name of JPL in, inside the tire treads of the rover itself. Uh, but you actually, as you can see, this video is absolutely tremendous. Uh, this is a picture of the heat shield uh, shooting off and heading down toward the surface. Uh, they actually can see this area right here. They actually show that they one of the springs came loose and they'll, they'll make sure that doesn't happen the next time. Uh, the landing spot itself, uh, they pretty much hit it right on the nose. They, I haven't seen the figures for when, uh, how close they did get to their primary target, but just from this particular photograph right here, this is exactly where they wanted to be. So, you know, trying to hit a needle, talk about a needle, hitting a needle in a haystack and talking about 150 million miles away and landing <laughs> pretty darn close to your target. Uh, so more pictures. This was taken from the um, sky train looking down to the rover and the rover looking back up to the sky train as it's releasing. Uh, that's the left and right pictures. And then of course the, the far right, the left, to right, the left top and bottom pictures, the right picture is of course the uh, lander heading down to the surface and kicking up uh, the actual sky train with the uh, hydrazine rockets that you could see or kicking up the Martian dust. So you're getting pretty darn close to the surface. This is the sky train flying away once it released the uh, Perseverance on the surface. It flies away. It landed about, I believe, a kilometer or so away. So it could certainly get out of the way and not have any chance of crashing into the, into the rover itself. Uh, this is a downlink picture from the sky train as it's releasing, as it's uh, guiding the uh, Perseverance down to the Martian surface. And you can see the actual detail uh, of these images. It's absolutely amazing. Another thing I wanted to mention, that, you know, these look like little toys in these pictures, but these are full size. I mean, I've seen men standing next to these 
landers and they're as tall as the men are and uh, certainly as wide and, and long. Um, so they're really something. So to fit all this into a rocket, a solid rocket body, shoot it off, have it, have it uh, last 150 million miles to real nasty space and, and, and ultraviolet rays and, and, the, and the tremendous cold in order to land on the surface. Of course, the landing going through the Martian atmosphere and the high winds and so on, they just really did an excellent job. Uh, the different stages right here, crew stage, the back shell, the descent stage, the rover, and the heat shield. Talks about all the different types of antennas. JPL is just like the computer industry, and Lou, Lou can attend to this. Lou Berman can, can, can attest to this. We have a lot of different acronyms, and so does JPL for the different, different types of antennas. Uh, but there are three antennas on the rover itself, uh, X-band, the UHF, and a very low-band antenna. And uh, we can actually send a, a, not only an image, but mostly telemetry back, directly back to Earth from the very low, low baud rate. And when I mean low baud rate, I'm talking about 30 to maybe 3,000 bits per second type of, uh, type of baud rate. Uh, if you remember back, well, of course, I remember back in days of three having a 300 baud modem and then 1,200 and 2,400 baud modem. Uh, I think my my current Ethernet and internet is a gigabit, uh, so you're talking about a thousand. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a million, a billion million. <laughs> uh, so you have X-band uh, types of uh, radios going on here. I will send everybody the links to all these particular articles. I don't want to spend time actually going through each one of them, but you have an X-band and a UHF antenna. Uh, these are, these point back to the uh, NASA Deep Space Network, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, if you're going to be sending up the two megabit per second that you actually saw in the first diagram or the first slide, that is uh, sending it up from the service to a passing satellite. And there are five up there that are sharing not only their own workload, uh, but they are able to capture uh, the telemetry or the image and beam it back to Earth. Uh, so that can happen at two megabit per second. And MRO is one of those particular type of uh, satellites that are up there. Uh, these are the three antennas that we talked about. The two on the, to the far right of the rover right here are the UHF and, and the high band. And then the other one is the very low band. Uh, it talks about the X band high gain antenna. And you can see that their mission reception is from 160 to 500 bits per second uh, to and from the Deep Space Network, 112 foot diameter uh, antenna, uh, usually in Spain, uh, on Goldstone in California, and a few other places. Uh, the one they took they took her to talk about right here with the X the X band goes to a to a dish, a very large dish in Spain. And to give you an idea right here of image quality, this is before they actually uh, unpacked the high high resolution cameras. So this is a 320 by 240 uh, pixel image. Uh, took uh, about 56,000 bytes and it took about nine and a half minutes to, to send that up from the service to one of the passing satellites. And then of course the X-band low gain antenna that we talked about before has a different radio frequency. They all, they all transmit in different radio frequencies. Don't, don't even think about trying to pick up that radio frequency. Uh, it's, you'll need, like I said, 112 uh, foot antenna or so to pick it up. Uh, but uh, even the X-band low band uh, radio from the servers directly to earth and back again, which by the way, takes about 11 minutes each way at the current uh, orbit of Mars as far as distance from the earth to Mars and Mars back to earth again. Uh, but the low gain antenna takes about 10 bits per second going to that same deep space network 112 foot diameter antenna on Earth. And then you have the UHF uh, going through the Mars orbiters. Uh, there's our different five different satellites here uh, and we'll get the names of them right here. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbit, Orbiter uh, will transmit back to us at four megabits, MAVEN, the TGO, which I wasn't even familiar with at all. It's a combo uh, satellite sent up there by uh, Europe, the ESA, the European Space Agency and Russia. Uh, two megabits per second, and the 
Mars Odyssey and the Mars Express, and since they're much older technology, uh, they're transmitting at 256,000 bits per second. Uh, then it talks about the fact that we do have to wait for these satellite, any one of these five satellites to, to go over um, the same latitude and longitude of Mars that the orbiter is in order to transmit these images and telemetry up and then bounce them back to Earth. So we are, and so we have to do that. We have to share time uh, with all the other experiments that all these other satellites are doing. Um, uh, the Deep Space Network, uh, the link down at the bottom here, you go to DSN Live uh, and look at the DSN Network. The top images right here from Madrid, Spain, uh, the different, uh, different types of uh, issues there. Uh, Goldstone in California and Canberra in Australia. And finally, two other slides, an uplink signal from, uh, from Earth to the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. Uh, to, uh, we can only send it at two kilobytes per second, 2,000, I'm sorry, not bytes, bits per second at 7.16 gigahertz frequency. Uh, if you're familiar with Wi-Fi, you're talking about 2.4 or 5 gigahertz frequencies. And look at the power transmitted. Uh, 18 kilowatts of power is needed. Uh, your Wi-Fi antenna at your house is only is a fraction of a, of a fraction of a watt, at the most three quarters of a watt, uh, or say 750 milliwatts. This is 18,000 watts of, of radio power uh, through a 112 foot diameter dish in order to send uh, two kilobytes of data up there. And it takes 11 minutes for it to get there. Uh, and we are, by, through these deep space networks, still receiving downlink signals from Voyager 1, Voyager 2, way back from 1977 at 160 bits per second on that frequency. And you can see the power received is, is 4.37 times 10 to the negative 2 watts. And finally, uh, NASA.gov, Mars.NASA.gov is where you can find all this information at. And as I mentioned before, Lon TV is a actual YouTube site that I'm subscribed to. He has all kinds of information on uh, computers and photography and um, networking, so on and so on. Uh, that's all I have for a, my presentation. Uh, is there anyone else that has anything to add before we have Jeremy announce our speaker? Not really. Mike, I have, I have, I have very I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Andrew. That's okay. <laughs> very sorry, Andrew. No, that's okay. Uh, Andrew, our observing chairperson, our wonderful observing chairperson, and I should know because I was observing chairperson at one particular time. <laughs> and it is it is quite a job. Andrew does one hell of a job. There, there are okay. some there are some paintings of some significant people in the observing chair Hall of Fame, definitely. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. If I, can anyone see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, taking silence as affirmation. Uh, so thanks, Mike, for that great report. I took like a, a um, wireless signal processing course uh, for graduate, and it really piqued my interest in that. So uh, nice, nice that I can like recognize a lot of those turned down stuff. So thanks for that. Um, but my name is Andrew Hishner, uh, for those new people, uh, and I'm the observing chair for DBA, and this is my observing report for February. And we're going to kick it off with an astronomical league award. Congratulations to Alan Purdy for the Alternate Constellations Award, certificate number seven. So congrats, Al. Um, I had not heard of this award. And as you can see, not a lot of people have because they give out these certificates in numerical order. So he got the seventh certificate. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting. So we, we look at, we observe the constellations um, from the Greek and Roman uh, cultures out there, but there are other cultures around the world who also named constellations in the sky. Uh, and this Astronomical League Award has a list of 48 constellations uh, from other cultures and, um, and people. And you basically observe 48 of them, you observe and sketch, don't, don't really worry about the sketch part, uh, it's just dots, okay, in a kind of shape, you'll be fine. Uh, but it's pretty interesting. So, uh, so take a look at that. It was a neat, a neat one to look up. Um, I also wanted to point out uh, there is a beginner astronomy class uh, that's being hosted right now. It's being hosted by the um, Chester County Astronomical Society um, out of Westchester, I believe. Uh, but what it is, it's a set of six classes um, exploring beginner topics. 
Uh, I think the first class is going to be on the sun and its effects on the earth, um, other than just like giving life to it and stuff, which is nice. Uh, also moon phases, a bit of planetary science, um, observing basics and observing equipment and also deep sky observing. Uh, so it is open to DVAA members. It's um, hosted by CCAS, but they're inviting a bunch of local clubs um, to join uh, because it's gonna be virtual. Uh, so the first class is Monday, March 1st. I know it's a little short notice, but it is free of charge. And when you register, you'll get a Zoom link uh, to log into the class. So I believe that there's more info on the website. If you can't find it, uh, you can email the board or I believe Don Nab um, emailed this to Harold to begin with. So reach out and we'll get you that link. So for the observing talk today, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about light pollution and specifically how do we measure light pollution. So we've all seen this map. We all love and hate this map. Um, there's Philadelphia right in the middle, uh, New York to the upper right, and then um, Baltimore and DC Metro down to the lower left there. Um, so the Bortle scale, which is showing, um, is really nice. You know, it gives these classes of numbers, but do those numbers have actual measurements? And they do. Um, and how did we come up with them anyway? And measuring light is kind of uh, what I'm really interested in, is what I do. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So brief um, brush up on the Bortle scale. So it's a nine level scale that measures night sky brightness or NSB, as I'll refer to it later on. Um, it was created by John E. Bortle in 2001, which is actually uh, not as long ago. I thought that it was a lot older than that, but it's not. Uh, it was published in a Sky and Telescope um, edition of 2001. So that's interesting. And its main goal was to give amateur astronomers the ability to evaluate observing sites and then to compare one observing site to another. Um, and it, it provides descriptions, which we're all pretty familiar with, but it also does give absolute metrics for measurements uh, in limiting magnitude and um, magnitude per arc second. Magnitude per arc second is just saying in this area of the sky, what is the magnitude of the sky um, with no stars in it? So you're gonna be seeing some pretty high numbers, which means dimmer um, areas of the sky in mag arc second. But just remember that's, that's a blank area of the sky, which shouldn't really have any light coming from it. Now, um, there is some scrutiny to this. Again, this is geared toward amateurs. Um, so it, some people have some criticism against it. Noticeably, there's some pretty drastic differences um, between classes, especially when you go in those higher classes, like between four and five and six and seven. And if you think about it, that's kind of uh, ex to be expected because the eye is a logarithmic, logarithmic detector, right? So um, as you go farther up the curve, there's going to be bigger jumps in between classes when we're trying to fit it to this linear scale of one to nine. Um, so here's just a quick summary. Uh, class one to nine with one being an excellent, truly dark sight, one and two, and then nine and eight uh, being city skies. So uh, usually around here, we'd be in the, the five to seven area. Um, three to four is, is really good. Um, I believe like Blue Mountain, for instance, is in this four to five region here. And then we, there's, depending on what map we look at, there might be different colors. This is the general color scheme that you would see on a map. Um, now, now, what I wanna focus on is th this right here. So intensity and magnitudes per arc second. So in the city sky, if you, if you measured an area of the sky with no stars, that sky would be brighter than 18th magnitude, equivalent to an 18th magnitude star, if you will. Um, there shouldn't really be any magnitude in here. So it, in class one, you're, now you're getting down to 22th magnitude. And remember, this is a logarithmic scale. So 22 is much, much dimmer um, than 18 here. So I really want to talk about, you know, how do we get this and what can you do actually to come up with these measurements yourself, uh, which I thought was interesting. So of course, the easiest way to do it is with a handheld device. So this provides a very big overview of the night sky brightness. It's meant to take the entire sky all at once. And what you would do is you would take this little device here, a handheld meter, you would point it towards Zenith and press a button and you would get a measurement. Uh, it's really great. It gives you real time measurements with little to no calculations and you can do it with a lot of different devices. So this picture here is of a sky quality meter 
And the sky quality meter is nice because it outputs your magnitude for arc second reading right on top here. Uh, you could go out, if you have an old film camera and you have a lux meter or so, you could go out and use your lux meter. Uh, you'll just have to do a little bit of math to convert that uh, irradiance measurement from, um, from a, a lux measurement to a magnitude measurement. Uh, but it can be done. And uh, a lot of people do install these um, kind of on their observatories and stuff to, to change over time, uh, maybe monitor clouds. If there's a cloud, then it's probably going to be a little brighter. Uh, maybe then it's time to, to roll, the, roll the shed off or, or over anyway. So this is um, the really the most common way for amateurs to do this. Um, now, if you have a um, camera or you're really interested into photography, you can do a little more advanced metrics such as photometry. So you can take this image here of the Orion Nebula and select a region where there's no stars. And then you can measure the pixel intensities of that region that should have zero light again. And then once you count for noise and all, you can determine what is the magnitude of this region. Um, it does allow for really high accuracy and repeatable measurements if you really understand your system but it, it's really hard to do this for a whole sky. Um, you, could, you could do like maybe a whole sky camera, but then you'd have to do a lot of figuring out like, um, you know, your, your distortion effects and all to get an accurate measurements. So this is good for um, photographers when they're trying to measure like certain parts um, of, that they image pretty frequently, uh, but it's not too good for just the, the regular amateur visual observer. Uh, now here's another method that um, a visual observer could use, which is star counting. So obviously, less night sky brightness will lead to more stars. Okay, you, if your sky brightness is really bright, you're not going to see as many stars as if it was a lot darker. So um, if you look at this chart here, up here, there's almost no stars visible. So this might be in like this city sky, whereas all the way over here might be more like Cherry Springs, where all of a sudden you're having a hard time figuring out what is the constellation that I'm supposed to be looking at over here, because there's just so many stars. And this can easily be done, you know, if, if you have a star chart and you're looking at an area of the sky and you know um, the limiting magnitude of your star chart, then you can compare that to what you see and you could get a rough idea of the night sky brightness. Um, you can also really easily do it with images. Uh, if you just take an image and then you can write a computer software or there's some available that will just count the number of stars in the image and then there you go. And then you just need to correlate that with the star chart to find the dimmest magnitude that you can see. Now, this is interesting, and this is where you can actually come in. There is a citizen science project called Globe at Night, which really revolves around this idea. Um, they use other measurements, such as the sky quality meter measurements and photometry, but this is really the main driver because it's really accessible. You, you don't really need to buy anything in order to do this. Um, so I encourage you, if you're interested, go to globeatnight.org. Um, and there's been more than 100,000 measurements from 115 countries for over nine years. And what I'm really interested in is this nine year portion because it's really great to see, you know, how is um, light pollution changing as we're both, as there's both more people on the planet, cities are expanding and also how we're adapting from, you know, those low sodium, low pressure sodium lights into like the LED realm. How is light pollution changing in one area? Um, so it's really interesting. And again, you can do this uh, if you do want to get involved. Uh, now, Two more methods, uh, one is satellite imagery. So there's several different satellites to go over um, at night. Um, to point out a few, there's MODIS, uh, VIRS, and then also the geostationary weather satellites. Of course, they see it all the time. And what you can do is you could select a pixel and you can measure the intensity of that pixel. And then you can even you know, back it down through the atmosphere to find how much light is leaving the area in that pixel. And this is really good. Um, it offers worldwide coverage and also this change detection, which I was mentioning, both MODIS and VIRS go over the entire earth uh, every day. So this is really interesting to see, you know, if you flip back through the years, how is this light splash spreading um, as we get farther and farther, more and more people move out into the suburbs. Um, now, it does have some drawbacks. You are limited to pixel size. So MODIS and VIRS um, are around, oh gosh, they're around like 20, kilometers or so, um, the pixel, pixel distance. Uh, and then the weather satellites out in GEO have much coarser resolution than that. Um, but it, it's really good again for this change detection. And finally, um, spectroscopy. And, you know, I was reading this and this brought up a 
I was a little surprised to think about this. You know, not all light pollution is created the same um, because you can take a lux meter um, measurement of the sky and it might be really orange or so, or it might be really white, depending on the kind of lights that are illuminating in that sky. And you could get the same sky quality metric, um, but the light pollution is not really the same. So this is an interesting way of determining, hey, what kind of lights are making up that light pollution? So over here, you have our tungsten incandescent bulbs. Um, you know, they're, they're not really efficient. Most of their energy is actually put out in the one micron meter range. Um, not a lot that we're seeing, but it's really continuous. So it's not it's kind of hard to filter this out. Whereas if a lot of your light pollution is low pressure sodium, you can put on a filter, one of those deep sky filters that Jeremy talked about once in his filters talk, and you can filter this out. Sure, you're missing some of this wavelength and here's some of this energy, but you can bring out a lot of detail if all of your light pollution is coming from mostly uh, low pressure sodium lights. So this can bring up a lot of useful information, but it, it again, it's really, this is kind of like photometry. It's really difficult to get a full sky coverage. You know, to do this kind of spectroscopy, you're talking about like micron slits um, into the sky to, to break up these wavelengths. So, not too practical, but still, it's really interesting if you're going to be imaging the same spot over and over and over again. So I just want to leave off, you know, um, night light pollution is a very active thing. Um, and it, it's really deterring, it, it can be really turned to our hobby, and it's changing all the time. Um, so if, if you're interested in learning more, again, I mentioned Globe at Night, globeatnight.org, International Dark Sky Association, of course, um, is the go-to to see, you know, um, types of light sources, how they're impacting light pollution, what can you do, um, resources on how, you know, somebody's like, why should I care about light pollution? Well, there's tons of reasons why somebody should care about light pollution other than just seeing the Milky Way um, where they live. So go check that out. Uh, also, if you want to get more local, check your local government light ordinances. And if you're having trouble finding that, we do have our own light pollution abatement program head by Barry Johnson. Uh, Barry's been doing this for years and years, and he's quite frankly been doing it by himself, which is a shame. Uh, so uh, if you want to help Barry, or if you want to learn a little more about, hey, what is, for instance, I live in Phoenixville, what is Phoenixville doing about light pollution, if anything, um, then Barry will have the resources to help you find that out. So, and uh, that's all I got for today. Thanks. Good job. All right, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for an excellent talk. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Uh, I wanted to mention there is also an app I have on my iPhone called Dark Sky Meter. I'm not sure it's available for the Android uh, operating system or not, but I, I do have that. That is a, an app that will able to measure. You basically hold your hand, you, you launch the app, hold your hand over the, uh, at the camera itself to get a dark frame and then point it to the sky and it does the calculations and, and logs the measurements for you. Um, in Andrew's talk, he mentioned Alan Purdy getting another um, award. Thank uh, congratulations, Al. Um, I wonder when they're actually going to have an alternate universe presentation uh, award. Um, is there anyone else? Oh, I have one other, I have one other thing was uh, asked to, the, to me through the chat. Um, Mark Fire, if, if I'm pronouncing his name right, Fire, uh, he did the image of the Rosette Nebula that uh, briefly appeared on the newsletter cover that I showed everybody. Uh, Mark, are you online and can you talk about it real briefly? Uh, sure, I'm online. Um, yeah, I uh, did that image. Well, you know, you can read about the, all the details in the newsletter, of course. But uh, it's an image I did in the Pine Barrens, which has been my go-to spot living in downtown Philadelphia. And uh, it was a uh, uh, 300 second exposures, I think maybe, uh, and I'm not remembering how many frames, but uh, it was, um, um, and it was, uh, I also did it in, uh, that was my first narrow band image. So I was using an, um, a 24 nanometer and 10 nanometer um, hydrogen alpha oxygen three uh, filter. So I basically uh, used the HOO palette um, to construct a color image from those two uh, grayscale images in those two narrow bands. Great. Um, Mark, are you a member of the Astrotography Forum? 
Yeah, you mean the SIG group? Uh, yes, that, the SIG group, yeah. yes. I just started, a, I've been to two of their meetings, so I'm a new okay, member. Okay, great, great. Uh, if anyone else is, uh, wants to learn more about the uh, types of uh, nomenclature that Mark just mentioned, please join the Astrodoggy Forum. Uh, okay, again, one other, one other thing, uh, is there anyone else that has anything to add before we have our main speaker? Okay, silence is deafening. All right, take it away, sir. All right, thanks, Mike, for uh, chairing the meeting tonight. Always glad to have somebody uh, step up to do that. So I'm Jeremy Carlo, the uh, program's chair. And uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's invited speaker, but uh, first a couple of uh, quick announcements. So uh, please uh, mute your microphone uh, unless you're the speaker. And also you may wanna shut down your video just to uh, save on uh, some bandwidth. So if you have any questions during the talk, just uh, put them in the chat and we'll periodically uh, check through those and uh, maybe our speaker will be able to answer some of those. Otherwise, you can hang on until the end and we'll always have a, a lively uh, Q&A. All right, so a little preview of some upcoming uh, presentations. Uh, next month, we have uh, Dr. Steph Lamassa, who is from the Space Telescope Science Institute. She'll be telling us about supermassive black holes. In April, we'll have Dan Wertheimer. Uh, he's from uh, UC Berkeley and he works on SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So that should be an interesting presentation. And in May, we have Michelle Hanlon, who's at the University of Mississippi School of Law, and she's going to be talking about space law. So I'm interested to learn what that is. And I think if you're uh, thinking about committing any crimes in space, you might want to wait until after the, uh, the May meeting. All right. So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce our uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Jolene Carlberg. So Jolene did her PhD in astronomy at the University of Virginia. And before that, she did her undergraduate work at a place that uh, many of us know, uh, Villanova University, uh, right around the corner. Uh, she did postdoctoral work at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, as well as at the Carnegie Institute of Washington. So her interest is in red giant stars and exoplanets. And currently, she's the user support lead at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So those are the folks who uh, run the Hubble Space Telescope. And Jolene is one of the people that interacts with the users of the Hubble. Obviously, they don't actually go up to the Hubble. So there has to be some uh, intermediary between, you know, the actual instrument scientists and uh, the users, that is the, you know, the world community of scientists. So uh, please join me now in uh, welcoming Jolene Carlberg. And she's going to tell us about a window into the ultraviolet universe with Hubble. All right. So thanks, uh, Jolene, and take it away. All right. Um, all right. If you see the presenter view, give a shout out. Yes, I do. Sounds yes, ma'am. Uh, You're good. It's good on. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, you actually remind me. I apparently need to update my uh, CV a little bit. Um, I have moved up in the world from user support lead to actually leading the SIS instrument branch right now. Um, uh, which I wanted as part of my introduction. Um, so this is the Space uh, Telescope Imaging uh, Spectrograph and one of the instruments I'll be talking about. Um, and as Jeremy said, my interests are um, scientifically are in um, exoplanets and red giants. And the reason I bring this up is just to let you know that uh, a, a subtitle for this talk could very easily be a very highly biased and by no means comprehensive um, overview of some of the really interesting things that you can do in the ultraviolet. Um, these are just some of the things that I find uh, the most interesting and I hope you do as well. Um, I want to give a quick roadmap of uh, some of the things I plan to talk about. Um, I, I like to always just start a little bit talking about UV light itself just to give you a sense of the um, kind of special properties um, that it has and where it is on the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, I'll spend a nice uh, amount of time talking about how the UV light detectors on HST work. Um, they are, HST right now is the only thing that can observe in some of these ultraviolet wavelengths, and the detectors that they have work in uh, ways that you may not be familiar with. And so I wanted to talk a bit about that. Um, and then I'll spend a, a, large, chunk of, um, a large chunk of the talk um, on some science highlights uh, covering um, a number of different um, scientific topics, um, so I won't have time to go into very many of them in depth, and so please I hope you have, um, ask some questions um, at the very end of the talk. And then at the very end, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, what some of the future um, ultraviolet uh, um, work might look like, um, and some of the missions that are kind of in the early planning stages. 
All right. As I'm sure you're aware, um, ultraviolet light is on the elect electromagnetic spectrum at wavelengths bluer than what our eyes can see. <clears throat> You've probably um, heard some of the terminology um, that is sometimes used, um, such as the UVA, UVB bands. Uh, these are the um, types of ultraviolet light um, that can actually uh, penetrate all the way through the Earth's atmosphere and reach it to Earth. Um, so the, um, the atmosphere of Earth effectively blocks uh, most of the wavelengths um, that are shorter than about uh, you know, 3,000 um, angstroms or 300 nanometers. Um, I apologize, depending on the source of my images, they, I'll flip back and forth between nanometers and angstroms, they're off by a factor of 10. Um, so ultraviolet light covers about um, 100 to um, somewhere in the 300 uh, nanometers or 1,000 to sort of 3,000-ish um, angstroms. Now, once you get uh, towards the shortest um, wavelengths of light, um, it tends to be termed vacuum UV, and this is because um, the uh, UV light is so readily absorbed by air um, that its path length through the air is um, very, very short before all of it is actually absorbed. Um, you'll also hear a few times in this talk, um, far ultraviolet or near ultraviolet. Um, this just gives you a sense of where those sort of overlap. Um, so a lot of the detectors on, on board Hubble um, use this terminology. Now, with uh, different types of light, um, you can always see different types of thing in, things in the universe. And so I wanted to give two examples of this, starting with a terrestrial example, since a lot of people um, are most familiar with um, ultraviolet light in terms of um, you know, potential exposure from the sun and the dangers that it can cause for our health. And so what I'm showing here is a visible image of um, someone who has actually survived uh, melanoma cancer. Now, we know that sun damage is able um, to cause um, basically freckling, um, clumpy pigmentation on the skin when, you, or when you're exposed to too much sunlight. Um, but you can see this person here, if you look in visible light, you actually don't see um, too much evidence on the surface of their skin um, that there has really been any significant damage. But it turns out if you take a picture of the same person using um, a slight ultraviolet uh, wavelength, um, that light penetrates a little bit deeper in the skin and you can actually see that this person has um, actually uh, accumulated a significant amount of sun damage. And so the apparent freckling um, of this person is actually seen uh, much deeper under the skin. And so UV light in this case can uh, sometimes be used as a, a, a bit of a diagnostic um, to be able to um, get a better sense of the amount of sun damage someone might, might have been exposed to. And a good tr um, um, example um, from uh, space would be, of course, what uh, stars look like. Um, and the sun is a great example here as we were talking about uh, skin damage um, from exposure to sunlight. Now, if you can actually get your eyes to be able to see the surface of the sun quite well, uh, which uh, please don't look at the sun, you, you all know that, um, the, the sun's disk is actually quite boring most of the time. So I'm showing a visible light image here um, showing a large cluster of sunspots. Um, but this is actually a fairly um, uh, noisy um, image of the sun. This usually doesn't have this much um, uh, sunspots on it. Um, and you can see that you know there's a sort of pattern here of stars, um, I'm sorry, of uh, sunspots here. Um, but if you take a look at the same image of the sun taken at the same uh, time and look at it in ultraviolet wavelengths, you see a much different and more uh, dramatic picture. Um, the sun looks a lot more dynamic. And that pattern of sunspots that you saw in visible light, which were showing up as sort of dark patches against the underlying surface, um, actually show up in the ultraviolet image as very bright sources of light. And this is because uh, sunspots are um, regions where the sun is very magnetically active. And the the material is actually slightly cooler than the sun's surface, and so that you get a much darker thermal uh, radiation from these regions, um, but the magnetic activity is emitting a lot of light in these higher energy um, regions, and so you get a lot of bright emission here. Okay, so um, you've been hearing me talk and describe ultraviolet um, as highly energetic, um, and that is because of this uh, property that we know uh, photons of light have. Um, the energy of any um, photon of light um, only depends on the frequency or the color of that light. And it turns out um, that there is a very um, interesting uh, property of some materials um, known as the photoelectric effect um, that actually uh, was responsible for helping early scientists um, understand um, this particle nature of light. And basically what the photoelectric effect is, um, if, is if you irradiate um, a, a metal, for example, where the electrons have a relatively um, low um, 
potential that's kind of holding them to the surface. Um, depending on the color of light that you shine of them, you can get some of the electrons um, to be uh, bounced off that surface. And it turns out that if you get to a, um, a color of light that's too low frequency or too red, um, you don't get any electrons coming off no matter how intense that light source is. You actually need to get above some threshold energy to be able to knock electrons off. And so this is what the photoelectric effect is. And as you move to even more ener energetic particles, um, as that light is incident, um, the electrons that you knock off actually come up with much um, higher um, velocity from that material. And the reason why I bring this up is that uh, the ultraviolet light has enough energy um, for some common materials um, for this effect to work. And that actually forms the basis of some of the uh, detectors that are currently in use above um, aboard Hubble. So I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail on what these kind of detectors are. So the, there are three instruments on board um, Hubble that have what are called these MAMA detectors. And MAMA is short for a multi-anode microchannel array. And I'm going to break that down a little bit to get, give you a sense of how this works. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but if you can, if you want to look on the left side of the plot um, figure here, um, I want to talk first about the central region here, which has these kind of funny holes on the top and this sort of curved structure underneath. So what's happening is you have incident light coming in from above and uh, going down into um, these pores um, of this material um, that's called the microchannel plate. And what happens is as these photons of light come in, um, ones that have enough energy to liberate electrons um, will start to do just that. And there's an electric uh, potential um, between the top of this, uh, these channels and the bottom of the channels that help pull the electrons down. And as they hit more material, you get uh, more electrons coming out. The reason why this is important is that a single electron is actually pretty hard to detect. So you actually want to amplify uh, the signal uh, quite significantly in order to be able to detect um, <clears throat> these photons of light. Now, it turns out that this curve pattern, um, it works really well to get very high gains of electrons, where basically a photon of light comes in and it starts off with one electron getting knocked off. Um, but then down at the very bottom, you get a cloud of um, 100,000 to millions of electrons. Uh, coming uh, coming out the other end. Um, and it turns out that these uh, the, the curvature of this, um, while it's really difficult to manufacture, is actually one of the best ways to do this. Because you can imagine electrons, um, they want to repel each other. And so it turns out with different shapes of these channels, the electrons um, start to actually repel each other back up the channel and instead of away from your detector. Um, so having these uh, C-shaped curved uh, detectors are really work the best to be able to amplify the signal. However, uh, one of the downsides to these detectors is that if you have a very um, bright source, um, you actually run the risk of uh, too many of these photons coming in, too many electrons being liberated at the same time, um, can actually permanently damage the detector. So all of the instruments aboard Hubble um, that use these type of detectors have to be screened um, every observation to make sure that they um, don't um, undergo um, this sort of catastrophic destruction. And there's a flight software board as well um, that will automatically shut down the instrument just in case there's an inadvertent overillumination. Okay, so that is the microchannel aspect of the MAMAs. So now I want to talk a little bit about the multi-anode part, which is what um, allows you to make the detections of the light that's coming in. So these anodes um, allow you to uh, make precise measurements of the location of these electron clouds. So what I'm showing here is a grid of anodes where the um, horizontal anodes on the top, about, top and bottom are running to a, to a set of electronics that's actually measuring uh, the signal of electrons. And then the vertical um, anodes are connected to those, in a, uh, to those horizontal ones in a series of patterns. Um, you can ignore these larger circles here. Um, you can just take a look at uh, this twofold. This is basically representing the size of an electron cloud that's falling down um, from that microchannel array um, onto the wires. Um, so a pixel size here is basically defined as the distance between two of these uh, vertical wires. Okay, so how does this work now for detection? So in this case, um, we have four anodes on top and six anodes on the bottom, which um, allows you to have 24 unique combinations um, of top and bottom anodes. Um, so to show how this works, um, let's just consider um, this top uh, horizontal anode, which again is being um, is the one that's uh, connected to the electronics that reads detections. You can see it's connected to three of the uh, vertical anodes. 
So if you imagine now that a cloud of electron comes raining down somewhere over here um, on the left side of this detector, you'll see that it's basically going, the electrons are going to travel along these vertical um, anodes and are going to light up uh, the top and the very bottom anodes as it's spread out to the detector. If that same electron cloud happened to fall just a little bit to the right, you're now lighting up a different pair. Um, and so now you can imagine as you step um, along uh, different places along the detector, um, again, focusing just on where the, that top um, anode is lighting up, you can see that the different patterns of top with different um, uh, bottom anode pairs um, creates um, corresponds to where the detector is. Um, so that means that you can actually, just by seeing what combination of anodes are uh, receiving electrons, you can figure out where in your detector you are. This, of course, is only working in one dimension. Um, so to get two-dimensional inf information, what you have to do is stack a pair of these arrays, one on top of each other, uh, rotated by 90 degrees. Um, and what you're looking at here um, on the left-hand side now is, actual, is an actual mic uh, photomicrograph image of a portion of the cyst anode array. Um, and so if you imagine, again, an electron cloud falling down here, um, you can see it will light up uh, certain combinations of these um, anodes. Now, the reason why um, these anodes um, look to be different thicknesses um, is that the, um, the top layer of this detector um, are represented by the vertical um, anodes. And so um, they're basically shadowing uh, the horizontal anodes be uh, beneath. So in order to have basically roughly the same area of um, anodes on the top and bottom, um, the bottom ones are a little bit thicker. And so all of these different combinations are then uh, fed to uh, the electronics, which is responsible for uh, reading um, the, um, the detection of these photons, uh, these electrons, which were originally originated by photons. And just to give a sense of uh, scale here, um, this is a, a photograph, um, obviously pre-installation, um, of what the cyst anode array um, looks like. So it's actually um, quite small. Okay. Now, one of the really uh, fun things about uh, these MAMA detectors compared to other types of detectors that you might uh, be more familiar with is the ability to have a very high time resolution. So for example, um, optical devices, devices like CCDs, which are you know, what's uh, responsible for uh, a lot of the optical instruments um, aboard um, at uh, optical observatories on the ground, um, as well as what's powering uh, digital cameras. Um, you expose them for some period of time, you collect um, electrons in your um, various uh, pixels, and you basically only read those out at the very end. Um, it's, it's been sort of like into like a little bit of a bucket brigade where you kind of have to pass those electrons um, all the way um, individually um, out to the, uh, the ele electronics that eventually read them. However, um, for the MAMAs, as the electrons are falling down onto these anode detectors, they're able to run along these anodes and basically go straight to the, um, to the electronics that uh, reads them. And so it's, uh, this, this, for example, can actually read these uh, photon cloud events with a time resolution of 125 uh, microseconds. And uh, during that time, it can actually process four events. And so there's actually two, 32,000 events can be detected per second. And SIS and these other um, instruments have the ability to um, store data in two modes. Um, one is an accumulated mode, which only keeps track of the cumulative count, so basically um, makes it act like one of these uh, more conventional detectors. Um, but the other option is the ability to actually do time tag observations where you store um, not only the location of each of these um, uh, signals that come in, but also a timestamp. Now, you may be wondering um, why these two options are available. Why wouldn't you always want to measure in time tag? And a lot of this has to do with um, your data limits. Um, but before you even get to the data limits, uh, of course, there's the limit of uh, what happens when your photons in, come in too fast to count. As I mentioned previous, in the previous slide, um, there's only 32,000 counts per second um, that the electronics are capable of reading. So if you're above that limit, um, the, uh, you, you simply can't uh, read them fast enough to be able to do, um, to keep track of all of them. <clears throat> Um, however, you run into um, problems at even lower uh, count rate limits. So STIS um, has two data buffers that it uses to uh, store the data before it actually gets dumped onto an HST data recorder. And those buffers each take 99 seconds to read out. Um, so what that means is that you're, if you're taking a nice long exposure, um, you'll fill up one, one buffer and you'll switch over to the second one. And while you're taking data on the second one, that first one will be reading out. 
But if you are looking at something bright enough with a count rate over uh, 20,000 counts per second, by the time you fill up that second data buffer and try to go back to the first one, it's still reading out. And now you have to sit there and wait and you're losing um, all of the information you could be getting um, because you have to wait for a buffer to become av available. Uh, so that sets another limit. Um, the other, other limit that you run into um, is that there's only so much um, data, data dumps that you can make to the HSC data recorders uh, before you again run out of room. So you can imagine if you're reading, if you have an object at the 20,000 counts per second, um, where basically you're able to read just fast enough that by the time you finish one, uh, filling up one buffer, you can quickly switch back to the other one and that one's already finished. Um, it turns out you can only take 50, minute, 50 minutes of data until you can't um, store any more data on HST to then read down to the ground. Um, and just to give you a perspective, the way that um, HST schedules its um, observing time is by orbit. Um, HST orbits uh, once every 90 or so minutes, um, and depending where you're looking on the sky, you get some fraction of that amount of time. So at this sort of um, you know data rate limit, um, you actually can't even quite full, uh, fill a whole um, HST orbit before you again start to run out of room. Um, and so. Uh, if you if you've ever um, are familiar with um, planning HSC observations, um, it actually can get quite uh, complex. And so we provide these astronomer um, astronomers these planning tools that allow you to kind of get a a sense of exactly what HSC is doing in detail um, during your observations, so that you can plan to use it more efficiently. So what I'm showing here is a screenshot from one of our astronomy planning tools for an op set of observations where the um, the scientist doing this was interested in looking at a very bright star and doing tam tag observations. Um, so the color coding here um, at the very beginning of the orbit, and so the orbit is, is measured in time on this bottom axis, which is in minutes. Um, so HSC has to do a few things. It has to find its guide star so that it can control where it's pointing. Um, once it does that, um, it can go through an acquisition sequence where basically it, it um, precisely locates um, the target um, that you want to look at. And when it's done with that, you can finally start taking data. And in this case here, uh, since uh, the person doing this observation wanted time tag, you can see these uh, black uh, squares here are every time um, a buffer dump is happening. And by the time you get to the end of your science observation, you then want to switch to a wavelength calibration. Um, one of the sort of uh, funny behaviors of this is that it, it forces both buffers to dump, so you actually get stuck waiting here for a little bit before you can even take your wavelength calibration. Um, and the same thing goes here. And so you can actually see this is an example of where the um, you pretty much are getting as many buffer dumps as you possibly can um, in a single orbit. And so this allows um, observers to try to figure out um, which regime they're in, whether or not they can actually uh, successfully take all the data they want without running into any of these data limits or if they have to make decisions um, to, um, uh, to change their observations. Okay, so now that I've uh, gone through just a sort of basic overview of how um, this instrumentation works, um, I'll, I'll go into the UV science cases next, but I'll take a quick pause here just to see if there are any questions on that. Okay, um, hearing nothing, um, I will continue on uh, just to give a uh, an overview, um, a high level overview of some of the really interesting types of things that you can do um, with um, ultraviolet observations. Um, so of course, um, I would be very remiss if I don't um, almost immediately highlight um, the time resolution capabilities in the ultraviolet. So what I'm showing here um, is a STIS uh, imaging observation in the far ultraviolet of the planet Jupiter looking at one of the poles. And I actually forget if this is the north or the south pole off the top of my head. Um, and the emission that you're seeing here um, is due to, it's essentially it's aurora, um, so it's due to the um, energetic particles in Jupiter's magnetic, uh, magnetic field. And one of the really fun things that you can see about this is you'll notice these sort of uh, circular trailing um, curves on um, in the aurora. This is actually um, the uh, Galilean moons, which are orbiting within uh, Jupiter's magnetic field, um, interacting with the magnetic field um, and causes these footprints to be observed in the auroral patterns of Jupiter. Now, this exposure um, encompasses about 40 minutes worth of observation. Um, uh, basically shrunk down into about um, four or five seconds. Um, and so it's not quite showing um, the, you know, the, the super high time resolution, um, but one of the great things about this uh, time tag observation is that if you went back to this original data, 
um, you could go back and make a movie basically on any time scale that you want um, between you know that 125 microsecond um, uh, time resolution all the way up to the full uh, 40 minute exposure time and try to uh, pull out much more detail about um, how exactly um, th these are changing on very small time scales. I also want to highlight um, since uh, HST is a uh, it's so a publicly funded um, through NASA. Um, all of the data does eventually become public, um, and actually, usually only after. Oh, yeah, yes. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I'm afraid to go back to the video. Um, so the main thing, um, if you um, are able to go back to the slide, um, the main thing that I wanted to highlight from there um, was the um, the Planetary Light Show uh, website, um, where you can go and see um, um, uh, other um, representations of other planets in our solar system. So it looks at um, all public HST data of things in our uh, solar system. So you can look at Aurora of Saturn and of Jupiter, um, and these uh, GIFs are, are sort of automatically generated. Um, so I highly recommend it. Okay. Um, and I don't, let me ask you really quickly, um, when that happened, were you trying to, were, were folks also saying things on the line? We were trying to get your attention by, by talking. By talking, we okay. You, we also sent you some chats and and try to ask you to unmute and things like that. We tried a lot of kinds of other things. Okay, so something just completely cut off my audio connection because I could not hear you either. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Hope that doesn't happen again. All right. Um, so apologies for the interruption. Um, so I want to talk now um, about uh, UV exoplanet transits. Um, and starting with an artist's representation of this evaporating exoplanet, GJ436b. Now, even though this is an artist's uh, representation, um, the, um, there is um, scientific data um, that basically um, helped us get this idea of what this planetary system might look like. And I want to describe to you um, how, how we have this idea um, for this planet. Um, but to do that, um, I first want to um, give you a little bit of background on how exoplanet transits work. Um, so if you look over here um, on the um, left-hand side, um, what I'm showing you is an actual observation, in this case of a different planet, um, but just to illustrate the point, um, of a transit observation. Now, an exoplanet transit is essentially when, from our perspective, a planet orbiting another star passes um, in front of the star from our viewpoint and blocks out some of the light. So if you happen to be staring at that star at that time and measuring the light that you receive, you'll see that it stays relatively stable and then it will suddenly dip down as the planet passes in front of it. And as the planet um, falls off, um, orbits off the face of the star, um, the light returns back to normal. Now, in this particular representation, you'll notice that the planet is represented both by a solid uh, uh, black circle, but also this sort of semi-transparent gray atmosphere around it. And that is what forms the basis for exoplanet spectroscopy. The solid planet is going to block all wavelengths of light, but the atmosphere is gonna preferentially de block certain wavelengths of light depending on what elements are present um, and how um, massive and extended that atmosphere is. Um, so if you look at exoplanet transits in different wavelengths of light, um, you can get a sense of what's in the atmosphere. But you may also notice that the um, transits might have different uh, depths, different amounts of light, um, that's blocked out and might actually have different timing, which can also then be mapped to the composition, the size, and the shape of the atmosphere. All right. So now let's move uh, back to this uh, GJ436b system um, and look at an exoplanet transits in um, ultraviolet light. Now for here, I'm not showing um, a flux as a function of time. What, I'd, what instead I'm showing is a couple of observations um, that are focusing in on a very particular wavelength of light known as Lyman alpha. Now Lyman alpha um, is an emission feature um, uh, due to electrons uh, moving around energy levels um, inside a hydrogen atom and it emits a photon of light at a specific wavelength. And stars that have very active chromospheres uh, tend to have a lot of emission um, at this particular line. Now, I want to bring to your attention um, the wavelength scale here. Um, remember, I said that ultraviolet covers a few thousand angstroms worth of light. Um, you'll notice here we're zoomed in on only 1.5 angstroms of light total. 
Um, now, it doesn't quite look like a, a single emission feature. Um, and the reason for that is uh, the middle part of the line, actually where you would expect the line to be brightest, is missing. Um, and this is because there's hydrogen um, between us and the star that's absorbing away some of the light. And so the star's light um, sort of baseline level is what is represented um, by this black line here. And so that I'm labeling uh, the out of transit light. Um, now, as I uh, progress, I want to point out um, when I'm talking about out of transit and in transit, I'm going to be referring explicitly um, to what you would see in optical. Um, so you can get a sense of the difference um, you see in this particular wavelength of line. So right before um, the optical transit starts, so in this sort of pre-transit phase, you can actually see that in part of the line, um, part of this um, emission line, some of the light is already missing. Um, and as you continue the observation uh, during the optical transit, um, this green line is showing when the planet is now directly in front of the star and you see a very significant um, depression in the line. Um, but then as the planet, um, again, from the optical perspective, um, moves off the face of the star, you actually still see substantial um, absorption. And this is exactly uh, what led um, to this artist's representation here. You can see in this planet, um, as shown here, this, if, you, um, if this cloud of material is hydrogen, you can see that as the planet is orbiting around, you would expect the hydrogen to start blocking some of the starlight before the planet gets in front of the star. And once the planet moves off, there's this long tail of hydrogen that continues to absorb light. Um, and in the paper that announced this discovery, um, the author has mentioned that the ultra, ultraviolet transits repeatedly start um, up to two hours before and tend to end more than three hours the optical transit. Um, even more striking um, is how much light is blocked. Um, so in the ultraviolet, um, as much as half of the light is actually being blocked during transit, um, that's compared uh, to the optical transit depth of this actually um, quite small planet where, where only less than 1% of the light is being blocked. And so this is exactly uh, the type of observation, um, you know, that's really ma only made possible by um, ultraviolet, um, ultraviolet wavelengths um, that are detectable only by um, HST right now. Okay, um, so I want to step to uh, a different um, scientific topic. Um, really, I'm going to have to go much faster because of this re uh, repetitiveness. Um, so um, I'll try to uh, cover this uh, quickly. Um, one, um, another uh, topic is actually the study of very metal poor stars. So as you probably know, uh, when the Big Bang happened, um, hydrogen, helium, maybe a little bit of lithium um, were created. Everything else on the periodic table had to have been formed by a star, um, either during the lifetime of the star or when the star violently explodes. Now, the interesting thing about this is the very first generation of stars that only had hydrogen and helium, we think were extremely massive and died fairly quickly. However, the very next generation of stars, which are still incredibly metal poor, um, we think formed across a wide range of masses, and in particular, low mass stars live a long time. So these most metal poor stars, any of the elements that they do have present, other than hydrogen and helium, were likely forged in that first generation of stars. And so the study of these most metal poor stars is also the study of that very first generation of stars. Now to study uh, the composition of stars, uh, what you need to do um, is look at their absorption features. So I'm showing um, on the top right, um, just a spectrum of a sort of generic sun-like star. You'll notice those dark bands are where light is being absorbed by cool elements in the atmosphere. Um, a different way of looking at that information is shown on the left where you can see um, basically a normalized brightness as a function of different colors or wavelengths. And in a sun-like star on the top, um, at these very blue wavelengths of light, you see many, many dips and wiggles here that is all absorption by different um, abundances um, in the star. But as you go to more metal poor, so things with much, much less uh, material other than hydrogen and helium, um, these lines get significantly weaker. And in this particular metal poor star, which has only one 400,000th the amount of um, heavier elements, um, you can see the, um, the spectrum is almost completely featureless. However, ultraviolet gives us a window um, into these stars because you actually, um, the, the, the absorption lines are much stronger um, for some of these types of stars. And so for these are on the right hand side here are actually the same three stars now looking um, into bluer wavelengths of light going into the uh, near ultraviolet. And you can see for this uh, star, you can still get detectable amounts of um, different iron lines in the star that you can measure. 
And from this type of work, um, what scientists are attempting to do is measure the relative abundances of all these different elements. Um, so in this particular case, uh, what this is essentially showing um, is relative abundance of um, all of these different elements are the black dots. Um, and then they're comparing them to model supernova explosion. So basically what they're trying to see is does the pattern of heavy abundances in the star, which came from the previous generations of stars, what does that tell us about um, that the star that must have polluted it? And so in this particular case, they're comparing to different, um, you know, 25 solar mass um, supernova explosions um, of different energies. Okay. Um, another uh, particularly um, fun thing that you can do in the ultraviolet is study something that's called a tidal disruption event. Um, and this is an energetic um, emission of light um, due to the tidal, dis tidal disruption of a star. And this is basically answers the questions of what happens if a star gets too close to a black hole. Now, I'm using the word tidal here. Um, most people are familiar with tides um, on Earth, um, which are due um, to the moon's gravity tugging on, um, tugging on our oceans. And essentially what you need to know about tides is it has to do with the fact that um, the gravity that you feel um, from from a massive object depends on both how massive that object is, but also how close you are to it. And in certain regimes, um, it matters uh, which part of you is closer to that object. So right now, my head technically feels less gravitational force from the Earth than do my feet, uh, but it's so small that it doesn't really matter. I don't really notice. Um, in the case of the moon and Earth, um, the moon is massive enough um, that, um, that, that it matters. Um, but it's not just the mass, it's also the distance. So the thing you need to remember about black holes is that it's a lot of mass that is packed into a very, very small region. So for a supermassive black hole, for example, we're talking millions of suns worth of material packed into something that's only about mm, 10 times the size of a sun. And so for the case of me, for example, if I went really close to a black hole, um, feet first, it would eventually become relevant that my feet were closer than my head. And um, one thing that happens is that people would get spaghettiified. Um, they get stretched out. The tidal forces would pull you apart and kind of pull you in um, feet first, a little bit at a time. And the exact same thing happens to a star. When it gets too close, um, it, the differential gravity across the surface of the star pulls it apart and it falls um, piecemeal into the black hole. And as it does so, a lot of the um, that infalling energy um, turns into heat, and that really hot gas emits a lot of energy in the ultraviolet and X-ray. And so the ultraviolet uh, spectroscopy um, of these tidal disruption events are now probes into both the composition and the fading of that hot glowing glass that didn't quite make it into the black hole yet. And so these spectra here are just showing um, uh, three different epochs of a uh, tidal disruption event. Um, with the reddest being the earliest um, observation and progressing through. And you can see how um, the amount of light is fading. And what scientists are doing um, are trying to look at how the shapes of these features um, due to different elements change so that you can study the outflow and the abundances of, of the things that are there. All right, another highlight um, that I think you might find interesting um, is uh, the CIS observations um, trying to understand this historic dimming of Betelgeuse that happened at the end of um, 2019 into 2020. Um, so uh, Betelgeuse, you know, is the top left shoulder of Orion. Um, and if you look at the brightness um, in magnitudes, um, there was a very significant um, almost uh, two uh, magnitudes of dimming uh, that took place with the star that was really um, kind of unprecedented. And there were a lot of ideas about what might be um, happening. Um, a cis ultraviolet observation um, actually uh, resulted in an interesting hypothesis of what could um, be causing this dimming. And the idea here uh, was that um, Betelgeuse, um, which is a very, um, it's a very evolved star, um, that a portion of the star um, actually um, became very active and ejected um, a large amount of material. So sort of like a, a coronal mass ejection. The idea here is that as this uh, material moved away from the star, um, it would eventually cool off and become quite opaque. And it just so happened that um, our perspective um, from Earth, it was essentially like a transit, right? This material was between us and the Earth, and so it blocked out the light. And one of the observations that supported this um, is uh, observations of these magne magnesium emission lines um, from, uh, from Betelgeuse. 
Um, and these three different colored um, emission lines here um, on this right-hand plot correspond to three different times. And in particular, this red um, spectrum um, was sort of right um, before this dimming event took place. Even more interesting, um, Betelgeuse is actually large enough and close enough to the Earth that STIS can um, marginally resolve it, um, which means that STIS can tell, like HST can tell that it's more than just a dot. It actually sees a little bit of spatial uh, size, which is fa fairly rare for stars. Um, so they were able to localize where in the star uh, this uh, mission came from. And so the hypothesis here um, is that, um, you know, this event um, was, was a large um, magnetic um, a burst of energy that actually ejected material that then cooled and blocked the light from the star. All right, so I, I'm in the last of my uh, science highlights. Um, so I want to talk just a tiny bit um, about this ongoing uh, project um, that's taking advantage of the ultraviolet um, capabilities of Hubble, which is called the Ulysses Program. So this is the Ultraviolet Legacy Library of Young Stars as Essential Standards. And basically what this is doing is dedicating a large number of orbits um, to study um, young stars in both the high mass regime and the low mass regime um, across a wide range of properties to have a better understanding um, of these classes of stars. Um, for the massive stars, um, they, uh, they decided to study these in very different extragalactic environments to understand how massive stars are different um, in different uh, metallicity environments other than in our Milky Way. And so there's about 160 stars that are being observed using um, uh, 450 HST orbits, uh, focusing on the large and small Magellanic clouds and two very metal poor external galaxies, Sextans A and NGC uh, 3109. Um, this middle plot here is just showing in an example spectrum of one of these stars and you get a lot of information. Uh, so for example, we've talked already about um, interstellar medium um, absorbing light between you and the system. Um, so you can see those features here. So here's a blow up of uh, magnesium absorption. And interestingly, when you look in extragalactic environments, you start to see not only the Milky Way's interstellar medium, but also the interstellar medium in those external galaxies, which happen at different um, velocities, which means it happens at different locations um, and wavelength. You can measure properties of the stellar wind itself. So some of these very excited lines have very characteristic uh, absorption and emission profiles that are um, due to the out uh, outflowing winds of the of the star. And then you can even get measures of the circumgalactic material of these stars, very similar to how you get the interstellar um, absorption. The other half of the program um, is low mass stars. And in this case, we're actually focusing in on the Milky Way, um, looking at different star, um, star forming regions. Um, so I have an image here on the right showing the Sigma Ori cluster. Um, Sigma Ori is the, the brightest star sort of in the bottom middle of the of the image, um, two of the stars in um, Orion's belt are in the sort of um, upper right and sort of middle. Famous Horsehead Nebula, you can see peeking out there. Um, and so what this is looking at, again, trying to cover a wide range of um, different um, mass stars, but all at very young stages, where they're still where the stars themselves are still actually pulling material onto them at the very um, early stages of the formation. And again, um, particularly in the, in the ultraviolet, which is these sort of purple and bluish regions, you get a lot of these strong emission features, um, which tell you about the winds and the outflow and the accretion of these stars. Okay, um, so I just wanna uh, wrap up quickly talking a little bit about the future. Um, as I've mentioned many times now, um, HST right now is our only window um, into um, to the shortest wavelengths of light. Um, but HST is actually a fairly small telescope. It was designed to fit in the space shuttle um, and the mirror is only 2.4 meters in diameter. And this image is just showing um, to scale uh, some of the different sizes of um, um, either real or concept mirrors. So JWST, um, as you know, which is launching um, later this year, um, is gonna be one of the, lar the largest um, space-based telescope that we have. Um, these factors here on the bottom uh, show you how much more light gathering power you have compared to HST. And uh, this loop or concept, uh, concept um, is basically trying to look at how to put a very massive HST successor into orbit um, that has um, capabilities to see in this ultra wavelengths, uh, these ultraviolet wavelengths. And right now there's two very large mirrors um, that are under, consider under consideration. And the reason why you want such big mirrors is that you want more light. Um, more light lets you see much fainter objects and have much more efficient observing. Um, for example, I've uh, discussed how we've pointed HST at, you know, the bright star Betelgeuse. And if you've been wondering, if, like, well, how do you point HST at such a bright thing if you're worried about bright light and the detectors from early on in the talk? 
Um, and the reason is that um, red stars are, um, put out very little light um, at ultraviolet. So this is just showing some representative spectra going all the way from, I'm sorry, this is down microns. So ultraviolet is in the shaded box here. Um, visible is sort of in this middle region here. And this is showing where the light is coming out. Um, the vast majority of Betelgeuse's light comes out well red of what we can see with our eyes. And by the time you get down to the ultraviolet, it's practically zero. Um, these are models of just the, the thermal energy coming out of the stars. If you, if you add back in a little bit of that, those emission features, you can see there's, it, it's not zero, but it's, it's very small. So you can imagine um, that trying to study these stars um, that have very little output in the UV um, gets difficult very quickly. And in particular, stars like our sun, um, the types of stars that we're interested in these exoplanet transits around, Hubble has a very limited number of stars that are bright enough that it can see um, very well. Um, the other thing, of course, um, is the spatial resolution. So the larger your mirror, the finer detail you can see. Uh, the upper right region of this plot is showing an image of Pluto as taken by the New Horizons flyby. A very beautiful image that came back. But up until then, um, HST gave us the best look that we had um, at Pluto. And despite the fact that Pluto is inside our solar system, the best that um, HST could see was this sort of blurry, blobby looking thing. And so these LUFR concepts that are coming out would actually allow us to see things in our solar system with much greater detail. And in particular, this largest concept mirror, this 15 meter uh, concept, we would actually be able to distinguish this distinctive heart-shaped heart uh, feature that we found on, um, on Pluto. Okay, so um, just in the interest of time, um, I'm not gonna uh, go over too much in detail. I'll leave up my summary slide here um, just to remind you of the different things um, that we talked about. Um, and I invite you to ask uh, questions if you wanna know a little bit more of any, any of these things. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Joey. Great presentation. Yes. Yeah, great presentation. Thank you very much, Joey. Everybody can unmute themselves now to like to ask questions. I do have one question from uh, YouTube from uh, Jeff. He said, how many spectra is a Hubble equipped to study and are UV one of the more common uses of time on HST? Um, yeah, so uh, ultraviolet is, um, uh, for, for our instrument, is, it is actually a, a very popular usage. Um, we have um, ongoing a UV initiative right now that tries to encourage the community um, to use um, the you know, the, the UV capabilities. Um, I wanna say our, the target usage is 40% of, of the time for the instruments that are capable of it. I think I would have to double check that number though. Um, and I do know that if, so if you, if you were to search at the UV initiative on the Space Telescope website, um, I believe they tell you what their target is. And I do know that on average, um, we, we are kind of reaching that target. So yes, they are, they are quite popular. Thanks, there's a follow-up on that. Uh, does redshift from the cosmological expansion limit how far out uh, into space you can see with UV instruments? Um, for certain types of physical processes, yes. Right. So the idea there um, is that hot, very high energy radiation, um, you know, by the time it makes it all the way to Earth, um, is going to be redshifted to much uh, uh, lower um, frequencies. And so, um, yes, if you were interested in the um, if you're interested in the ultraviolet um, behavior of some really distant things, you actually don't look in the ultraviolet, right? You would look at um, much, much redder things. Um, and yes, if you go far enough away, um, basically you don't have high enough things that would be redshifted into the UV band. Um, so yes. Uh, rather than a question, I have a comment and that is concerning what you said about the uh, dimming of Betelgeuse. I am so glad you covered that truthfully because I honestly didn't forget about it, but it happened. It didn't seem like it happened so long ago, uh, but I never did read up on exactly what they say the cause might have been. But I remember going outside and looking at Betelgeuse many times during that time frame and 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 pretending that I saw them dimming, <laughs> um, although it might have been just effect of the, uh, the upper atmosphere. Um, but I'm glad you covered that. Uh, one of the questions I do have is about the uh, future telescopes. You mentioned LUVAR. Uh, I'm assuming the UV is ultraviolet and the IR is infrared. What do the other two stand for? Yes, uh, the um, uh, I think so. I think just visible. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So UV optical. So it's uh, ultraviolet takes up two letters, and then optical mm -hmm. is the O, and then IR is infrared. And I'm assuming the L is large. Large. Yes. Yeah, I thought so. Yes. They, yes. They, this day and age, they seem to be doing large and, yes. and uh, a lot of other names. 
for these super large mirrors that they're building, uh, yes. both, on, both on Earth and in space. Yeah, um, yeah, ground-based, I think, is up to extremely and outlandishly right. and all sorts of <laughs> right. qualifiers. Yes. Um, any idea about the future telescopes, how far away they're going to be? I know JWST, I believe, is a million kilometers or so. Are, are they talking about close distance for for the future telescopes for the infrared and ultraviolet? So I, I honestly think a lot of that is still up in the air. I mean, these are very early mission concept studies. Um, you know, they, they already have, you know, two major, um, you know, mirror designs that they're kind of studying in, in more detail. So I think a lot of that is up in the air. Um, mm -hmm. There is a Louvre final report uh, that I was kind of skimming through to get some of this information that's available on NASA's website. Um, you can kind of dig in and see um, in more detail um, what, what some of the plans that they're thinking about. So I honestly mm -hmm. couldn't say with any certainty right now. Mm -hmm. I see. I really only wondered because of the servicing mission, because I we all remember the Hubble servicing mission. Yes. And the fact that you could do it, JWST, there is no servicing mission. Right. So, I mean, we, we, you know, either you work or it doesn't, you know, one or the other. As you're looking other at the different, uh, different concepts for uh, new telescope designs, could you comment a little bit about some of the sort of the trade-offs? I mean, obviously, bigger gets more expensive. And at some point, maybe bigger doesn't really get you much more. Uh, you know, kind of where are you at with the size of these telescopes in terms of could you do more if you could afford to put a bigger telescope and, you know, so a little bit about those that sort of optimization. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of it is is trade offs. Um, so, for example, even with the with the mirror designs, um, those two sizes actually have to do um, with um, rocket launch. Um, capabilities. Uh, so the smaller one is sort of more, you know, fits with more known, proven um, launch capabilities, whereas um, I believe the larger size mirror depends on not yet proven technology, but could be available um, sizes. So that's like one step right there. Is it, is it isn't even money so much as like, do we have the ability to put something that big um, into a rocket? Um, and then the designs of the mirrors are also different. Um, I believe um, you know, you start looking at things um, sort of on axis versus off axis. Um, and I don't, I don't know all the details of, of how those uh, trade offs come in. But then depending on, on those sorts of things, you know, that changes the complexity and with complexity comes risk, um, for example. Um, so I, I would say those are some of the major, um, you know, pieces that you have to consider. We heard a presentation on the James Watt telescope and they said that we're at the limit of how far back in time Hubble can go because of the redshift and it just things sort of go off scale. And I think they said that, that Watt will be able to look a little bit closer to the Big Bang than what you can really see with current telescope technology. But after a point, you won't be able to go farther back in time because there won't be any light to see. Yes, yes, and James Webb can do that, um, partly because of its size, but actually partly because of how far into the infrared that it's going. Um, so that comes back to that um, earlier question about how much redshifting happens. And so that actually, um, is, is more solved by um, the wavelength ranges that JWST would cover. And that I don't think would be as far um, as the LUVOR concept. The IR in there, I think, would be more near IR. Um, it's just because it's, it's trying to more optimize the blue and it's hard to do both at the same time. Thanks. Yeah. yeah for those Luxor designs, would they be sent up in pieces and assembled in orbit maybe? Um, I think they want to fold it. <laughs> um, if, again, like you should check out the report in more details, but um, the concept of like how you get this into a rocket, um, no, it's uh, it's like folded in, in to the side and then like it needs to, you know, unwrap and stuff. Um, the kind of nice thing, um, you know, with the comparisons, it's sort of JWST successor in some technologies and HST successor in other technologies. So it would need like a sun shield, but it wouldn't need to be as, as substantial as James Webb. Um, because again, for James Webb, the farther to the infrared you go, the better you have to cool it and the better you have to stabilize that cooling. Um, so it turns out the sun shields don't have to be as, as complex, um, which, is, which is good. Uh, I, for one, like to find out a little bit more information about your, your duties at, at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Sure. You mentioned that the uh, Hubble, of course, does every, every 90 minutes, just like the ISS. How far in advance do scientists have to put the, the, the um, papers in in order to get time on Hubble, for example? Yeah, um, so 
Basically, um, every year um, there's a call for proposals. Uh, the next the next one is in spring. Um, and actually, because of the complexity of how HSC observations are scheduled, you, you don't need to know all of the details of how you would do your observation um, when you submit. And so you submit a phase one, which basically says, here's the science I want to do. Here's roughly how I would do it. Here's my best guess at how many orbits I need to do it. Um, and then if you're successful, you're asked to then submit uh, what's called a phase two program, which actually makes the very specific um, observations and say, okay, I want to look at this particular star. And to do that, I need to do, you know, this sequence of events to do it, following all of the rules and regulations where you actually get a sense of, um, you know, where the telescope is pointing. Um, one of the interesting things is enough drag on HST's orbit um, that you don't know the ephemeris of very, um, you can't um, forward guess where it's going to be too far in advance. And actually for things like moving targets, um, so these are things in our solar system like Jupiter, which move in the sky relative to the background stars. Those actually can't be planned until uh, a couple of months before, um, just because you actually need to know the, the parallaxes and the positions um, precisely enough that you, um, mm -hmm. you just don't have the information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's basically on a sort of yearly schedule. Um, and then, you know, there's, once you find out that you get the time you have, um, you know, usually a couple of weeks, I think, to a month to then get that second mm -hmm. detailed observations in. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, another question you just made me think of is that you mentioned drag. Now, how about the other, um, not only instruments, but the, the actual working parts of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope, gyroscopes, so forth and so on? You know, we all know that it's getting pretty old, like myself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work anymore? Yeah, um, so lots of things work, um, which is great. Um, so STIS, uh, I'll have to advertise, is the oldest of the of the instruments that's still um, uh, that's currently functioning. Um, so that's been working for 24 years. Um, the whole observatory is over 30 at this point. Um, but in terms of the the instruments, uh, STIS was installed during the second servicing mission. Um, the gyros gyros do cause us some stress at times. Um, one of the servicing missions. Um, install these enhanced gyros that are expected to have longer lifetimes than the or original ones. And I think at this point we're, uh, I think all of the gyros currently in use are the, those enhanced ones. Um, and so there have been a number of gyro failures, um, but there's a lot of redundancies in place. Um, and so things are still still working, um, you know, sort of as they should be. Mm -hmm. Great, <laughs> good to hear. You talk about measuring transits, and I'm just curious. Yes. It seems like the chances of looking at the right from the right direction to see a transit means we're probably not seeing a lot of exoplanets if that's our only way to see them. Am I correct in that? Yes, and that is what kept the exoplanet community from doing that um, for a while, is that in order to overcome that low probability, you have to look at a lot of stars. And so this is the point of the Kepler mission, um, which originally started staring at a single patch of sky for a very long time, looking at the same stars over and over and over again. And it had to be a dense field so that you could increase that probability enough to have lots of detections. I had a question. Uh, what's the field of view of that uh, MAMA instrument? Because it looked like the detector was pretty small. It was like a postage stamp size. Yeah. Um... I want to, I should know the answer to this. It's 25 arc seconds. So it's yeah, like it's small. It's less yeah. than Jupiter's disk, basically. So it's tiny. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And another question from uh, YouTube. So is Hubble's uh, time for a given year generally fully utilized? And is it very competitive? I guess um, we it, amplify that. What's the oversubscription factor? <laughs> sure it is. I, I, yeah, I don't have my uh, the number off the top of my head, um, but yes, it, it is oversubscribed. It is um, it can be challenging to get time. Um, it's still very well used. Um, it, it you can't be a hundred percent efficient. Um, a lot of science programs have very strict timing constraints and where they want to look. Um, one of the ways to kind of improve the the efficiency. Um, is uh, there's these things called snapshot proposals uh, that you can submit, um, where basically you're not guaranteed um, any of them. But the idea is that you come up with a science case where you can give HST a lot of things to look at for relatively short amounts of time. And basically what they do is they, they use them to plug in the schedule and try to get, get HST as efficient as possible. 
Uh, you mentioned a moment ago exoplanets and how well, I actually forgot to talk to mention exoplanets. I have an app on my iPhone called uh, Exoplanets. Yes. And in the database, there's like 4,000, 4,300 different uh, confirmed exoplanets. And I am familiar somewhat with the uh, three digit initials for the satellite or instrument that discovered the exoplanet. If I was looking for the Hubble ones, what kind of initials would I be looking for? So Hubble um, isn't used as frequently to discover them. It's used as follow up. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, and again, it's not, it doesn't have the field of view to make it a very um, good survey instrument, which is what you would need to discover them. Um, so it's usually uh, people discover them through tests or through through the Kepler missions or through some of the ground-based missions. Um, and then once you de determine um, the best candidates to look at, you then follow them up with HST. Because then at that point, you know exactly when to look at them, uh, when the planet's gonna be between you um, and the star so that you can um, make these observations. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Julian, I have maybe a, a kind of a technical question. Sure. So are they, for spectral scanning on this, what's the time limitations there? Uh, I'm sorry, first, what do you mean by spectral scanning? Do, so um, first, what's kind of the, the spectral scan, the spectral range that you generally look at? Yeah. So. Um, I was focusing a lot on, um, you know, this, this UV, um, but uh, there's actually, we actually have three different detectors. Two of them are these mamas. One is the optical, um, and we can cover anything from, you know, um, 12, 1100, 1200 angstroms all the way out to almost a micron. And depending on your choice, we have a, a wide range of gradients to choose from. And so you can actually get a um, large swath of those at once at low resolution or um, at, in the ultraviolet, we have a shell spectra, which basically lets you, you know, hone in at super high resolution on small yeah. things. So on, almost anything you could kind of want to do, <laughs> you can kind of try to do. So yeah, that might be and, my best I'm assuming that. that in general, for, for most experiments, uh, when they pick a range, they stay with that range for the entire experiment. They don't try to do any kind of shifting to get higher resolution. Um, not necessarily. It, re it really depends on the, on the science case. So sometimes, you know, um, there are programs that want to know the sort of overall, you know, you know, spectral shape of, of their object, but then they also care about like one or two emission features that they want in high detail. So they'll take one observation that covers, you know, the whole broad range of wavelengths, and then they'll choose a second observation, um, you know, that focuses, hones in on one of those pieces. So it, it really is, uh, depends on the science case and you can, you can do a lot. Thank you. So does Hubble use like plate solving like some of us amateur uh, astronomers use to know where it's pointed? Um, to know where it's pointed, it uses um, the, it has a dedicated guide star catalog that it uses. Um, and so what happens um, is the, the fine guidance sensors um, when it points, oh, I actually don't know the full details, um, but I, I, I want to. I think maybe the answer is yes. That it that it knows what stars are supposed to be there, and it you know um, once it figures out the pairs of guide stars that it's supposed to be using, it locks onto those and says, okay, these two stars are the these two stars that I think they are. I know the coordinates from the guide star catalog, and then it uses that to to know how it's pointing and correct any drifts. Thanks. Is that an on-axis guider? I think no, but I'm not 100% sure, and I might just ask you, <laughs> look, we, there's, you can find a plot um, that shows the focal view. Uh, the fine bandit sensors are like on, on like a ring around some of the other, I think it's sort of, sort of on the edges of the focal plane, actually. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> You know, other, other people are still logged in. You can show yourselves and ask any questions. What might be happening, Jolene, is that a, a number of people in the club, especially new members, uh, they might. Some of this discussion might have been what we say over over people's heads, and and I I try to tell them the same thing I tell my students that I teach at Mainline School Night. Is you know start just just remember the talk, remember the remember remember the nomenclature, remember kind of what we talked about, and eventually it will make a lot more sense. The more reading you do, the more learning 
you you you, you do, the more uh, articles you read, the more things, I mean, YouTube videos you see, you know, it, it, it comes around. <laughs> Yeah, and I unfortunately went through some of the science slides a bit faster than I had originally intended, um, just because and, and I didn't want to be all fine. here forever. And, that, and that's fine. No, appreciate that. I had a question. Um, sure. I came in a little late, so you may have covered this, but but when you're measuring in in the UV using these detectors. Um, yes. Counting for the redshift, what what wavelengths are you at, uh, are they originating at? Well, that's a fun question. Um, so, I, I'm not 100 percent sure um, the which redshifts you're thinking about, um, but I will answer the question um, that. Um, you it does matter how fast, for example, HST is orbiting around the Earth. And so one of the things that actually happens um, as uh, the data is being recorded um, is that it knows what um, HST's velocity is, and it actually corrects the, um, the photon that HST sees for HST's speed around the Earth. So there, there is actually that velocity shift that you have to worry about um, to be able to understand um, the, um, the wavelength of light that came to the detector. Um, and then depending on your science case, there's additional redshift factors you might need to consider. Um, you know, again, when you're ta talking about like cosmological types of observations where the light is originating very far away and traversing large regions of space, the expansion of the universe Im imparts a redshift um, onto the observations. So is it um, possible that, that some of these detections in the UV actually started out as X-rays? Um, so I think you, you would have to, um, it's possible, yes, um, and I think you would um, need to think about that depending on the type of object you're looking at and understanding, um, you know, how fast it is moving relative to you. Um, short answer is yes, um, but I think the, the scientists who are interested in those sorts of questions are generally aware of it. Um, most of the velocities due to stars moving within our, our solar system, or solar system, within our galaxy, um, are, is small enough that you're sort of shifting um, well within the, the same spectral range. So you'll get a slightly different ultraviolet wavelength, but it's still in the ultraviolet. You don't you don't move around too much. So you're still looking at UV uh, yeah. spectral signatures rather than rather than yeah. X-ray spectral signatures. Yes, but but it is the case that if you look at really distant cosmological type objects, um, the UV light that light that originated from then in the UV can get redshifted all the way down into infrared um, wavelengths. Mm. Thank you. Yep. I did just think of one thing Hubble related, or possibly Hubble related. I believe it was Armageddon in the movie. Uh, they show where uh, they uh, immediately shifted what Hubble was looking at in order to view the the asteroid or the comet that was eventually going to hit Earth. Has that ever happened with Hubble that, that we basically have said, you know, let's stop doing what we're doing and, and shift to something else? Um, yes. So there are types of um, observations called targets of opportunity. Um, and they can, um, you apply for time for these types of things. Um, you basically have to say, this is the kind of thing we're looking for. This is how we'll know what it is when we see it. And this is how quickly I need Hubble to look at it. Um, and so there are a couple of different time scales that actually allow you to um, interrupt the schedule, make changes. Um, there's a certain amount of lead time that you can have. Um, you know, it's limited by, you know, how quickly you can talk to the to the telescope. Um, I forget what the fastest turnaround time is. It's on the order of uh, days mm -hmm. um, between the trigger and when it happens is the absolute fastest. Okay. And for the UV detectors, um, because they have to undergo these special um, safety checks, um, the fastest turnaround times, um, the UV detectors are ineligible for those kind of disruptions. Um, just because we don't think it gives people mm -hmm. enough chance to, to guarantee the safety mm -hmm. of the instruments. Mm -hmm. But for an asteroid, it's actually hard because you need, to, yeah, the field of view of, of Hubble is small enough that you actually need to know where that asteroid is moving. You need a really good ephemeris to actually see it. So I, mm -hmm. I think the Armageddon scenario would be quite difficult, actually. Right. I wasn't really bringing up Armageddon. I no, I know. Remember, just, just I remember that fact. part of the movie, they, they, they kind of showed that. I somewhat remember in the back of my head, though, uh, 
Hubble was shifted, I believe, for Supernova 1987A. When that happened, they, I believe, they they pointed Hubble, you know, toward this uh, large magnetic cloud and uh, try to get some information based off of that. I might be wrong about what I'm saying. Yeah, it, it wouldn't have been 1987 because um, Hubble okay. was launched in the 90s. Oh, okay. So I'm not yeah. thinking of something. Okay. But it might have been a you know 1987A like supernova. Okay, I see. Okay. Um, but okay. yeah, that's entirely possible. Okay. Yeah. What about something like a gamma ray burst? Because that you really need a very quick turnaround, like second mm. minutes. So would HST not be eligible to participate in that? I mean, it's just uh, seconds to minutes is completely infeasible. Mm. Um, you can't. Um, you know, because there's a certain amount of ground support that has to happen uh, before you can even mm -hmm. try talking to the telescope. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know the details of, you know, um, you know, the system that they used to actually talk to the telescope. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why the, the absolute limit, um, I forget how short it is, but like ultra rap rapid, I think it's still on the order of like a day or two mm -hmm. um, is the quickest you can go. Mm -hmm. I guess it might be like a couple hours by the time you'd start to see it in the visible, but it, it's very, very short. Yeah. I'm thinking more of the high energy instruments where if there is uh, a GRB, they want to get on that within like seconds. Right. Because that thing you blink and you miss it. Uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I remember reading about the Hubble deep field images and the fact that they trained the, train the optics and instruments for an extended length of time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and only and only that time, and you know, and and and, and nothing else during that time frame. And uh, I gather it was the director of the Hubble Space uh, Telescope Institute that, or the Space Telescope Institute that that went ahead and had people do that. Uh, if it, nobody has seen those images, I highly recommend that you that you look at them uh, on the internet. Uh, Wikipedia's got a quite a good article about it with some good images, and of course all the NASA sites. Yeah, and I'll actually point out that Ulysses program that I discussed is actually uh, similar. It's a director's discretionary program, so very similar to the Hubble Deep Field, um, where it's being um, executed by a, a large uh, fraction of staff um, at the Institute uh, to carry that out. Um, so it's like a spectroscopic kind of equivalent. Another question from uh, YouTube. Is the nature of Hubble's more traditional mirror not optimal for some spectra, like optical versus UV? Um, so the mirror is um, actually uh, certainly capable of covering um, a vast majority of the optical through the, um, you know, near to fall ultraviolet all the way out um, to near infrared. Um, I know on the ultraviolet side, it's around like 1,150 angstroms where actually the, it starts to be like the, the, the overall throughput of, of the optics um, starts to like tank. Um, I, I don't know what it is on the long end. Um, so it's actually um, quite well optimized for a, quite a large uh, range of wavelengths. Well, I guess on the IR end, you're probably thermally limited. And I, I don't think about the IR very much, yeah, and I guess <laughs> unfortunately. On on the UV end, I guess you're hitting the plasma frequency of the uh, the coatings. Um, yeah, I, I think on the ultraviolet side, it's, it's definitely the coatings um, that are starting to be the problem. Um, one thing I, I had meant to point out, um, just to sort of illustrate the difference between James Webb and you know um, HSC compared to its successor, um, you'll notice that James Webb was the only gold-colored um, mm -hmm. mirror there, and that's because for the very far infrared, right? You actually gold is the much better uh, medium for for reflecting those wavelengths of light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jolene, did you mention, or I must have missed it, if you did, what the optical field of view was of the HST? Um, so I don't, I don't know for the other. So again, um, I have the STIS bias. Um, the STIS has one of the smallest fields of view, um, so I actually don't know what the overall. Um, HSC field of view is. I know for our instrument, where it's 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 tiny. Um, we're looking at twenty five to fifty um, uh, arc seconds. Mm -hmm. Tiny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the imagers see a lot more. Like uh, with C three and ECS, they have a much bigger field of view, and I have no idea what it is, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Thought I'd ask. Well, it's probably still arc minutes, right? Which is still small by our perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I, I think so, yeah. 
probably not too many arc minutes. What's that, Lou? It's probably not too many arc minutes. No, no, certainly not. No. Yeah. I mean, the moon is what? Uh, 30, 30 arc minutes. 30, right. So. Yeah, the moon and the sun are both 30 arc minutes. Yeah. yeah. Because you can see, if they can see Jupiter clearly with that, then you'll want a much mm -hmm. bigger. Mm -hmm. This was already. Uh, yes, it was. Very good talk. It's definitely worth waiting for the little uh, glitch we had. Oh my gosh! And, and you're like probably right. You're no, probably it was right. Worth it. was the video that caused it. It it made it fun. For you, maybe I'm like, wait a minute. How am I getting a call from the lead of the talk? <laughs> I'm confused. This is confusing. I should probably answer this call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate your patience. Well, it's far from the worst glitch, right? At least you didn't turn into a, a cat or something in the middle of it. <laughs> That's true. I'm not a cat. <laughs> or there was that Nothing. Supreme Court hearing where somebody went to the bathroom in the middle of the talk. Right. <laughs> and you could hear it. <laughs> oh, fantastic. I, I absolutely make sure I'm on mute and stop video when I do that because <laughs> with the microphone building in my headphones here, <laughs> it'll pick up everything. Speaking of it's a good use for wired uh, headphones. Yeah. No mistakes there. <laughs> all right, well, well I, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm happy you. to stay on if there's more questions. Um, but, you know, if there's more follow-ups, you know, you're welcome to email me. I'm happy to, happy to answer questions. I like to talk about science, so. Right, thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jolene. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. all right, well, we, we have 27 people on. Let's see some faces. <laughs> I miss <Right>. you guys. <laughs> right. Should I shut down? There the we go. Yeah. That's up to you. Yeah, go ahead. All right. And maybe I'll uh, end the uh, YouTube feed.